All right. Well, welcome everybody to learning more about convention and program planning and how all these things come together, but also um, wanting to give you guys an opportunity to provide some input on convention as well. We'll share some of our thoughts and um, we have Ruth Ann is here from New Alm. We're so excited to go to New Alm. We really are to be in person is fun, but we'll talk about, you know, for people who aren't ready to be in person, we'll talk about what that looks like too. So, all right, well, I am gonna share my screen and pull up my little slideshow here. All right. Okay, view the slideshow. Okay, so here we go. So hopefully for most of you, it's not your first January jumpstart, but if it is, again, we're trying to organize uh, some training around our January is like a time where we're hitting the ground running, getting ready for session and getting ready for annual meetings and things like convention. And then we have our August Academy, of course, which is um, a lot of new leaders come on in the spring and summer. So it's a chance for them to learn to too. So hopefully these are helpful for you all in your leadership roles. So convention, this is from our largely from our lovely 2019 convention before we knew what was ahead with COVID. Um, convention, of course, is business and fun, right? We like to get together um, and have fun, but there's a lot of very important business that we need to get to at convention. Uh, one of them in the far right corner there were our last winners of our Hope Washburn and Peggy Thompson Awards, um, Paula Clark and um, Jerry Nelson with her beloved ex-husband, you know, now past husband, sadly, Darby there. I love that picture of Darby. Glad we had that time with him. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about convention, but I want to go a little bit into what the heck convention is all about, too, and sort of a reminder, you know, um, we've really been enjoying learning more ourselves sometimes about some of the intricacies of program planning and um, with all of the issues that are in front of us, but I wanted to just kind of bring it back to the roots a little bit and also give you those resources to bring to your own local leagues when they wonder, what the heck is this convention thing? And in our bylaws, actually, I put a link here to the bylaws, but it specifies you know, what what convention is. What is it? Why do we have it? What is it we're supposed to do? And I really like going back to the bylaws because I think in the years we've had, um, and sorry for the scrolling, I'll slow down here. But I like to continue to talk with people about the importance of governance. And we've sort of lost track of that, right? And some of the things we've seen. And this is who we are as league. We believe in governance, first and foremost, right? That is, and so that means we talk a lot about things, we bring up ideas, and we vote on things, and we have a process. And so process is, and when you talk about DEI, when people talk too about it, really, you know, the whole idea of eliminating bias and prejudice is about having an open process that everybody understands and knows. So sometimes it's good to come back to the bylaws and remind ourselves, okay, and we do this, Amy and I are working every year, we're like, oh, wait, okay, what are all the dates? Are things are supposed to get done? How does this work? So our bylaws really nicely articulate what convention is for, what it's about, how delegates are chosen. We'll talk more about that, who's represented and the powers that we have. We have the same thing for council. So that's, it's a good thing to kind of come back to that. Um, also, one of the most frequent questions we get is, well, how do we know our delegates? So the delegate count, so as of July, January 31st, right, all of you will be done entering your rosters. And when the rosters are done, um, we will, in mid-February, we will get a report of who, of how many members all of you have, and you will as well. So you will know exactly how many members you have. And most of you know that already because you've entered it into your rosters, but this is how it calculates. Um, it tells you for how many leagues, how many members you will have, how many delegates you get. 
So this is all laid out. Um, this is a document that's on our member resources page right now, but I've also linked it here. So this is number one question people ask. So feel free to pull this up and and use this. The other thing I'll say about delegates is that we never, at least in my six years here, we've never, no one, we've never used up all the delegates. There's always more people that could be present than are. So we'll get back to that as well. So I also gave you links to our last two conventions. So in 2021, our last convention, of course, was all virtual. So, but we do still have our web pages up for those so that you can see and remind yourself of what we did there, what we talked about, what's in the packet. Sometimes this is also really good for members. If you have newer members or members you're trying to encourage to participate in convention, to show them these web pages, to see all of the things that happen at convention. So these are still visible on our website under past events. And so we had, of course, the all virtual one, but then we also had our in-person one. So our in-person one, um, we still have the presentations. We have a lot of good stuff here that is just good reminders for us. Um, okay, so. Now, in 2023, um, however, so in preparing, I showed you we had all virtual, we had all in person. And, um, but we are in 2023, it will go back to being in person. But what we will do is add an, some optional streaming of highlights of the event. We can stream so that people can see a keynote speaker or see the debate or see what's happening. That's something we can do. But we cannot really have a true hybrid where people could vote remotely. There's a couple of reasons for that. And one is, is essentially, we do not have it in our rules. A lot of the, you know, parliamentary procedure wise, our bylaws will be changed. We'll, we'll recommend a bylaws change to have electronic voting. During the COVID era, we gave people that opportunity, but now we're not in that same emergency. And it's, it's really not in our bylaws. We also have found that it, it is, number one, it's very expensive. It's very difficult to do. I mean, you really have to have an outside firm to have a full hybrid experience. And we know from Nationals ex experiment with this, it was fraught with a lot of kind of negative feelings from the people who, you know, were not there. Um, it's, it's difficult to vote in person and remotely successfully. Um, and so we have decided that really largely from our bylaws reasons that we would try to, um, again, be able to have people see things and still be able to benefit from getting the information. Um, but I wanted to also mention the point of delegates. We never use all our delegates. So let's say there's someone in your local league who really cares about wanting to vote on an issue or really wishes they could be there, but they can't. They could also say, hey, why don't you go? And, and you could, you know, we don't have proxy voting, meaning you can't send in a, you know, a little receipt or something and say, please vote for me. But people, you could get someone else to go in your place as well. Um, Susan, you had your hand up? Yeah, I mean, you answered the question by saying that, you know, that when I go as a delegate, not, you know, but, and I want to vote a certain way, and then I can't vote twice, is what you're saying in person. Right. So if you're in person, you will vote however you want to vote on something. Um, so, of course, we'll have the update of the firearm study will be something that we'll be voting on. And we have the, the budget and the bylaws changes um, are all votes that we take um, during convention. So um, and yeah, but you would be you can only vote once. <laughs> And peer voting style. So I know it is not, you know, and looking at, you know, at Carolyn and people who are really, you know, way up there and, you know, that it is not um, a hybrid model might be really advantageous to you. But if we can help in any way, if, if being present, um, if there's some way we can help, 
you know, with costs or anything, we please reach out to me. We, I think, just realize that it's difficult to have the whole hybrid piece just really won't work for us. So that's where we're at with that. But, you know, we, we don't want, we never want money to be a reason people can't attend, right? So a few more things then about, about the overview here and where we're at so far. And this is still a draft. What's, what we do know is we're at the Best Western Conference Center in New Alm. I put a link there and you can see it's a great space and has that, um, I love that it also has the lovely German feel right away when you, <laughs> the good, uh, um, let's see, pull up the picture there. That's, don't you just feel like you've gone back to Bavaria right there? Um, so it will all be in one place. So we have, the rooms will be there, which is nice. And um, the convention will all be there. And also um, Upper Mississippi River Region is gonna try to do some optional events in our optional time as well. In general, we, we definitely need some business on Friday evening. And so we would have a plenary, the first plenary, which, you know, approving our rules and getting bylaws changes, some of those things really have to happen um, the day before. So we're envisioning something where we could have some optional New Alm events and or UMRR events early in the day. If people wanted to come early, that would be fun things. Then we would have um, an on-site social hour casual dinner as people are checking in from 4 to 5.30 or so. And then 6 to 8.30-ish being our official first plenary. Um, then we're looking at Saturday, also having some special caucus sessions in the morning. So we've feedback we've gotten and we've built this around the feedback we get from prior conventions and council meetings is there are people who will just want to come for the day and not come overnight. So we don't want to start too early or end too late. But we also need to maximize that day because in order to not go to three days, it used to be convention really was Friday through Sunday. You know, it used to be that there were two nights and there was a banquet and there was a lot going on. I mean, as early as I think 10, 12 years ago, but it, as, over, as time has gone by, people have asked for it to be shorter and shorter. Um, and yet people still want social time. So we're trying to accommodate those things. So the idea is that we would have some optional um, morning meetings that could be around like a budget caucus or um, um, firearm study, or maybe UMRR would want to talk about rivers or whatever. Then 9 to 4.30 being kind of the core plenary two. So in addition to the business of, the, of our convention, we also will have strategic planning as part of this convention. So we have, as you know, hired a consultant who's helping us with strategic planning, who will be getting and presenting some of the, the, the goal with convention is that they will be able to present to the members some of the, you know, some of the disconnects, the idea is like, okay, we've been doing all these interviews, we've had these focus groups, we've met with presidents, because we're going to have this president's retreat, um, very end of March, early April. And the idea behind convention is to say, you know, we've got some areas where maybe there's some disconnects or gaps of information. And so it's a really great opportunity then for member involvement in getting more clarity around some of the things that come up. So we are going to want to have two or three hours um, dedicated to that in that day as well. And then the idea then that people could leave if they needed to leave and drive somewhere, but we would also have an optional uh, dinner somewhere um, in town for people who wanted to stay. And I know when we, we had council in St. Cloud, this was a little similar to what we did and it was really fun. I think about half the group stayed in St. Cloud and went out for dinner and you know other people had to travel. So, um, so we've kind of looked at it that way. We've also looked at it being um, the proposed cost, trying to bring it down to very bare minimums with, if you came for Friday and Saturday, there's essentially three meals, but there's also, of course, the room rentals and stuff for the day being $95. But we always are asked every year, well, if I only come for one day, <laughs> do I have to pay as much? So 
we've made a one day only rate of $80. Um, of course, there's a hotel room reservation if you're staying overnight and you might have mileage or pay extra social, you know, if people want to do social things, but we're trying to keep it as this is as low as we've ever offered it, it, it in an in-person event. But also if there are those issues, um, you know, for anyone, anyone that you feel like um, maybe they need a place to stay that isn't expensive or need help with mileage or whatever, just let us know and, and we can, can work that out. Um, now, before we go on, it's a lot to start with, but I wanted to just kind of bring that, bring all that stuff up and then we'll move into program planning. Are there any questions or thoughts about the overview of convention? Does it sound okay? Any other ideas, things you, things we should think about, or if they come up, you can think about those along the way. All right, <clears throat> I will go back to my screen. Okay, so, all right. Now, these are just some of the deadlines too that we're working on here as we go through so you kind of see where we're at. We, our board sort of finalized the basic draft schedule and costs. So we are going to get the first call out for convention by the end of the month. That meets our four month kind of obligation to let the members know. We won't have registration open till March 3rd, but we know that as soon as we announce it, everyone wants to know how much is it gonna cost and what's the schedule? So we tried to front load some of that basic information so people would know and they could go on and reserve hotel rooms but we won't actually open up re registration till March 3rd. Now, another thing we've really talked about with re registration that's been a problem in the past is we thought we would have people register for the things they want online, but we would do the payment the old school way or by checks. We found that most leagues have checkbooks, but don't have credit cards, right, to pay for members. And then if members are going to do a social event that might have a fee, then there's a separate fee. And it always gets complicated to try to use credit cards. We certainly could process a credit card if needed, if that were the only way. But we're also going to try to make it easy for you all to be able to just, you know, bring checks to convention with you or mail them in advance. Um, and that way, that, that seems to be easier for everybody. So, and if it's not and you need to process a credit card, we can do that too. But um, hopefully this will also make it easier for registration. It won't be so confusing. Okay, so then um, we're going to talk about program review, but just to see how this all fits in and how fast all this starts to go here is that, um, you know, we're going to ask the program review and recommended studies. We need that to the board by March 15th because at our March 20th meeting, we will be um, kind of looking at survey program survey responses if there are any recommended new studies and um, finalizing our budget and then by April 24th all items need to be wrapped up and we need to get that final packet out six weeks in advance to attendees so it's already it's already big I'll also say in my last um, January jump start, I reminded everybody that the presidential election is really only a year away because, um, you know, the presidential primary is in March of 2024, meaning um, in January of 2024 will be early voting. So just wanted to keep that perspective. So anyway, that's kind of the overview of convention. So if things come up, let me know and we can talk about those. So I wanted to take then most of the time of talking about program planning. This has always been, we, we get a lot of questions about program planning every year. Um, and of course, defending democracy, as we know, is involves advocacy to support and defend our positions. And of course, all of you on this call know our positions are based on an active process of study, discussion, and consensus voting by our membership. And this process is central to our biennial convention. But I think this one slide in itself would be really helpful to teach any new members about what the heck is this program thing anyway, and what are what is it about all these issues anyway. 
And I want to say what's what's really exciting about this process are the examples we have as we go through this, because when you look at what we're doing at the session right now, um, you know, we had um, our medical aid and dying issue come up, right? Um, and they originally, when they brought it forward, it wasn't in the time frame, And so a lot of people forget about the time frames. So we're trying to be better about saying, okay, these are the time frames. If you have a new issue, consensus, briefing paper, we've got to, you know, everything has to kind of flow here. So then when they missed the time frame, we also had added that you could introduce a study at council. So they were great and then they got it on in council, but then because it didn't have board review, it had to have more members to say yes to it and they got it passed. Well, now um, the um, consensus, the Compassion and Choices group is working on a, um, now because we have passed this bill and our, because we passed this position, if we hadn't passed this position, we would not be able to lobby on this but we are lobbying on it this session. So uh, Gina Gentry from Rochester, and of course, um, Dr. Rebecca Thoman from Minneapolis. We have many league members who are very involved in bringing that issue forward and educating and getting consensus from our members. Our members studied it, they looked at it, they voted on it. This is why we can now act on it. So it's a great a reminder of the power of our process that we um, were deliberative. Yes, sometimes it slows things down, but it gives you the solid confidence that this is something we can move forward on. And, you know, I um, certainly this is something that comes from the members, but most of you all know too that I went through this with my mother this last fall. So I will be testifying as me, not, not as the league, but the league um, does have in the lobby core, we do have um, representatives on our lobby core who can now lobby on this issue. The bill is actually phenomenal. It's a really, really great bill. Um, so I'm excited about it, but it's a great reminder of how this works, okay? So the first thing is the reminder of the program planning guide. The program planning guide is on our website under member resources and been updated for the next um, biennium here. And the program planning guide says all these things I'm saying, what the heck are we doing here? And it tells you what the process is. And it talks also about the differences of the types of things of having a study or a briefing paper, <coughs> you know, like a briefing paper is a, a kind of a, you know, now in the world of information availability, I mean, some of these things we don't do maybe as much of, but, um, but it is another opportunity that people have where it doesn't change a position, it could add more clarity to position. Concurrence was really what we had. Again, we really used concurrence for the medical aid and dying position or death with dignity position, depending on how we framed it. Um, but if you're going to have new positions, this is what also tells you what you need to know, what, what you need to be saying to the board. And originally, if you remember, when the medical aid and dying position came forward, the board did not originally um, recommend it for consideration, not because they didn't like the issue, but it was right in the middle of our election denials and our threatened democracy. And I think people really felt like we didn't want to detract from that message that we needed to be focused on. So there's lots of reasons that people might consider for voting something down, um, but nonetheless, they persisted. And so all of that is here and talk about the positions that and how we do this. So I really encourage you to use this guide. Now, and all of that then a reminder that then all of our positions are in our program for action that are here. And, and all of that is laid out. So another example I'll say is that Gwen Myers has been asking about our position on national health insurance because there are some things coming up around healthcare. And it's like, is our position strong enough um, to do that? And we can lobby on things that come from LWVUS as long as they're state focused because we don't lobby, of course, the US Congress. Um, but all of our positions are also, again, on our website under where we stand. 
So if you're looking for those. And so the real thing that we need from you all now is local leagues is this program planning survey. And all this is is a guide to help you have a conversation with your local leagues about our positions. Now, some people do this very religiously every year. We've figured out some people have it built in and they do it every year. Some people haven't done it in years and they didn't even know we did this. There's no right or wrong there. There's no, no, there's, it's not necessary. It's not a mandated thing that you have to do a program planning process. But what it does is it helps, I think it, what, what's great is it's a reminder or a, it's an exercise for your local league to learn about the positions. Because people don't realize all the positions we have, or maybe they'll say, why do you have those positions? Well, you can look and read about that in the program for action. And so you also don't have to fill this out in total. Like you don't need to fill out every one of these things. And you're like, well, I don't really care about selection of judges. We're not going to talk about that. But maybe in your local league, you think like an example would be initiative, referendum, and recall. If you, you might be surprised to learn, you know, the, our position is we do not support uh, ballot initiatives and we do not support that as a method um, of citizen participation. Now that was during the time of Governor Al Qui. It's very interesting to read the study because all of our studies also, you can find our studies online, most all the studies we've scanned, all the ones we had. So I read the study on the ballot initiative. Absolutely fa fascinating to see what, was, what they were thinking about. And the idea was at the time that our, legislat our legisla legislature was so transparent that we didn't need a citizen, a, a workaround to the citizens' participation. Well, we might think about that differently today, right? I mean, our legislature has lost a lot of its transparency. This could be an issue where the league may, somebody may say, you know what? I think we should reconsider and whether we have ballot initiatives in the state of Minnesota. So for example, you might say, we wanna update that position um, or drop it and do something new. I mean, so what this survey does is give you an opportunity to look at things of interest to your local leagues and let the state league know where you, if, if you want to take any action on any of these issues. Because essentially we do vote at convention on our entire program, right? So the keep, like most people will just say keep, 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 right? Some people, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. You're not voting when you when you hit keep here. You're not voting on that. You'll still vote at convention. At convention, we will say, do we vote that we want our program for action to stay the same, you know, and, and people will vote on that and they almost always vote yes. And then any changes then are this process for program for action. If you want to um, update something, provide a briefing paper or do a new study, um, I think we, I was going to see if we put this in here. Yeah, end of life options. We had to add that because we have a new position. So we had to update the program survey with that in it. So now if, if any of you on the local league, now a reminder too that we as the state league, we do not take action on issues. Like, I mean, we do not promote or, or study, studies, studies. Um, we take action on lots of issues, but we don't do studies. So studies, briefing papers, updates, all of this come from the members. And this is um, where you would say you want to do that. So like when Marty and the group came, um, Marty Mix and the group said, we want to do an update to firearms study. That's what they would have done here, right? When I'm done to see where it is in here somewhere. So if they would have hit update, we want to update on that. Then down here, they here's the firearms and they said, we want to do an update. Well, then they needed to give us information. And there are a lot of people who will say, we'll get from local leagues to say, well, we want to do an update on a study, but they're not saying who would do it. <laughs> so just because you tell us you want us to update something, it's not us who does it at the state, it's the members. So this is the members tool for their work to be able to say, we want to have a new study, an updated study, and this is what it is, and this is, and we're willing to do it, and um, there's no cost, or we expect, you know, this is all of that good stuff. So, so it's a really great 
opportunity, I think number one, just to orient your leagues if this is a process we have. Um, I mean, it, you don't need to like literally, you know, run through every single issue. I mean, that would be a big thing, right? But it is a, a great chance for people to, to do that. And maybe you say this year, we want to focus on, you know, a couple of issues that are big for us and do a little deeper dive. And um, but if you want to be a part of working on anything, that's something you do have to organize and put in this document for us to know by March 15th. Yeah, Carolyn. Uh, yeah, last time when we went through this, it seemed like it was real hard to do that survey because you had a, a title there, but it didn't always follow the same order as it was in oh, our in position. The book? Okay. Yeah, in the book. And so everybody got confused. Well, where is this one now? And what's this? And is that the title of the whole thing? Or is this part of it? So could somebody okay. make yeah. sure that it tracks this year? Yeah, sure. I think that's a great point. I'll have I'll have Sam look through it and make sure it looks, you know, it's got titles that align. So that, yeah. you know, first page, first survey. Great. <laughs> Great. Now, or or put the page numbers on. Yeah, great point. Thank you. Very yeah. good point. Yeah. So Sam would Amy, be a good one to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, would you remind me of that? <laughs> I don't have any notes in here, but that would be great. And he can yell at me later. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a good, it's a very good suggestion. Yeah. So if people, you know, you can from the floor at convention, people can stand up and say, we want to do a new study on XYZ without it having come through this process. But it's really much more, um, and that is also outlined in the bylaws. So how we get things into program is all very annotated in the bylaws, but it is really um, much more difficult and the standards are much higher. Um, so I, we really want to encourage people if they really want to do something related to our program of for action to think about it early and have it considered in the program planning survey. Makes sense, good stuff. So hopefully now this is for state things, right? Because it's for the state convention. I do know that some leagues do this for their local league, right? You have local issues that you also work on and study. You have local studies and local, you know, it will do a program planning review. And of course that's welcome and a great thing to do um, as well. So, okay. All right, let's see here. Okay, so any other questions about program at all? I think that's, so I think that's the end of our slides right here. And so we could talk a little bit, how are people feeling about programs as a whole? Do people, do you think there's anything new out there happening? Any new thoughts going on? And anyone wants to talk about? I'm feeling like um, our firearms update was probably pretty timely, right? Um, sadly, uh, I think that will be something people, you know, just the definition, um, you know, changing the definition of what a firearm is was also so necessary. If you look at the a couple of these last shootings and the homemade nature of some of these guns, it's really quite stunning. Um, I will say at the Capitol, um, uh, Protect Minnesota is coming out. Of course, gun violence wasn't one of the top seven things, but we do have some people looking at that issue. So I'm glad about that. We just did our um, voting on that last night. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody was sort of like, sure, yes to all those positions, mm -hmm. but what exactly are the details? <laughs> So yeah. it's like, how are you going to enforce that guns are kept safely in the house? And what does that mean? And, and that sort of thing. So we support the idea, but mm -hmm. I would assume before the league would officially lobby on something, they would take apart a specific bill and really pay attention to those yeah. details because some of them could be really weird yes. and make it so that they're in, not workable. 
Well, and it's a very good point because another issue is ranked choice voting, right? So we have a position on ranked choice voting, which is our position is we support municipalities using ranked choice voting um, if they so choose. Um, but our position on using ranked choice voting at the state level is not that definite. It's not that we, we don't support that as the preferred way of voting. It's an option for consideration. So um, that what that means is, so we've been talking, of course, a lot of you will know Jean Massey from Fair Vote, and she does really great work. Um, there's only been two states. They were smaller states, Alaska and Maine, who have used ranked choice voting. Um, and um, uh, my dad just gave me a thumbs up. I wonder if that's another thousand dollars there. I'm wondering. <laughs> um, but ranked choice voting is, you know, um, only been used in these two smaller states. It has not been used in a state as large as Minnesota. The Secretary of State does not support ranked choice voting. So we as a local league have had to do exactly what you're saying, or as a state league, Carolyn, what you're saying is we need to see the bill and we mm -hmm. need to see because our position does not say that directly. Another example um, is um, with medical aid and dying, the general um, what we said yes to, what were base a basic a set of options, but it you know it depends on the bill. It wasn't like you know, there's lots of ways that people are initiating or could initiate or could support uh, end of life options. So we had to wait for the bill. The bill itself, um, oh, house file, I'm not going to remember 35, I'm not going to say it right, um, but it's on our webpage. We do have a whole new webpage now on legislative session 2023, where you can see all the things we're following and the hearing links and such. But that bill is really about, um, you know, providing um, an individual to have the medication they need when they want to use it. And they've really taken out a lot of the political language like assisted suicide and, you know, all of these things that are, you know, it really is about an individual's choice and being able to use that choice. But we've had to read the bill, right? So, so you're exactly right. We've, we not are, we're not necessarily jumping in without seeing what the language is. Yeah. Just as an aside, that ranked choice voting made me think, what's our position on ranked choice voting for the primaries? Well, it's another, it's another area where um, we, the way that our position is, um, and it is, and it's, it's a good question that is reminding me too, that it might be worth an, um, a briefing paper and you know, I'm thinking, Amy, or if we could get a lead, local league or member or, or even just an update, um, a briefing paper, even just to clarify, um, yes. you know, our position outside of the municipalities, because it is it, it is an area where our position is a little not so sure on well, those things like the presidential primary is a new one. What do we think about primaries? Yeah. And, and part of it is you're hearing that. Um, the parties have some, such a monopoly on who votes in their primary. Yeah. You are, we're only getting the extremes mm -hmm. and that's where we're getting a lot of this mm -hmm. terrible rhetoric and everything and yeah. then the compromise so that we're stalemating. So, so yeah, that sounds like- That's a really interesting point. That would be really good to look at. Doesn't somebody want to look at that? I'm looking around at y'all. Anyone want to take that on? I, I think that would be a really good. I, I think I'd want to look at it, but I'm not the I'm not really good at being the chair on something like that statewide. But yeah, I'd certainly well, let's, let's uh, float that around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great, I think just even like the what we've learned from the firearms study process that doing an update. I mean, there's been part of the challenge, I think, has been there. There's sort of a, a it was a past history that, you know, the state office didn't do anything at all or help at all or do anything with with um, studies. So there was sort of this weird, you know, kind of, you know, but on the other hand, we're like, oh, why can't we, you know, in this day and age, 
why can't we be supportive or helpful in the sense of at mm -hmm. least just the process too of how these things come together i mean information is more readily available but we can help people you know with how things get put together so Anyway, I think there's lots to um, consider there and, and especially where our positions are maybe lacking clarity, it would be good to, because it's going to come up, ranked choice voting, as some of these new voter um, issues uh, might get passed, there's going to be a move toward looking deeper at some of these others, so good points. Um, Ruth Ann, did you want to say any more about New Alm? You all ready for us to complain your fine town oh my gosh uh there is just one fun thing after another we've got an ice cream shop that is just to die for so you know <laughs> worth the trip worth the trip down and not to mention the beer of course and a of distillery course. and yeah. uh, and the parks and oh it's wonderful the weather will be wonderful you can <laughs> bring your bike and go on the bike trail and it'll be all fun 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 yeah Great. Well, we're looking forward to it and hope hopefully others will too. Again, all of this is to say that there's a tremendous benefit to being a member and having your voice on these very critical issues. And that means coming to convention. So we <laughs> hope that people will, will really um, want to do that and will be willing to get back out there. But if they feel strongly about it and feel like they themselves can't come to recruit a friend, um, I would love to to see us really, um, you know, have a good time together this year before something hits us again, right? <laughs> That's the thing. Enjoy your trip home. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns, or if anything comes up, if you have ideas, um, please let us know. And otherwise, we you will see an opening to convention with that sort of general um, overview of schedule. We'll be working with New Alm on what the actual activities are and with Upper Mississippi River region on what they're going to do and all that kind of stuff and getting that more flushed out and ready for the March 3rd registration, but we'll get all the rest of it out by early next week. <laughs>